Hi everybody, uh, welcome to another podcast in this anaesthetic series. My name's Mike, I'm an intern from Royal Melbourne Hospital and today I thought I'd talk about airway management. So why is the airway important? Well, if you think about the A, B, C, D, E's in the primary survey, airway is right at the top of the list. And this is because airway obstruction will cause hypoxic brain damage within minutes. And if this persists, this will lead on to irreversible brain damage and death. And we think about the airway as being patent on and protected. And its patency can be affected by obstruction, which can be complete or partial. And partial obstruction is also a serious problem as it can progress to total obstruction and or interfere with the ventilation of the patient. We also think about the airway being protected from certain consequences of loss of consciousness or reduced neuromuscular function. And these consequences can be aspiration, obstruction of the air, or reduction in ventilation. So to understand how to assess and manage the airway, we need to consider the anatomy of the airway. And the airway begins from the nose or mouth and extends right down to the main bronchi. And if we look at this diagram, we, we can see a lot of soft tissue structures, including the soft palate, the tongue, the epiglottis, the laryngeal cartilages, and also the tracheal cartilages and soft tissue surrounding them. So therefore, anything extending from the mouth down to the main bronchi that are surrounding the airway inside the airway or around the walls of the airway can obstruct the airway. And in respect to the applied anatomy, we look at the tongue as being a major soft tissue organ and occupying a large portion of the airway is therefore a major site of obstruction. And the tongue is attached to the mandible via the genioglossus muscle. And when a patient loses consciousness or they have a reduction in conscious state, all their neuromuscular or the neuromuscular tone around the airway is lost, which means that the tongue actually collapses back onto the soft tissue of the airway and therefore obstructs it. And in considering our knee anatomy, we can do certain things to intervene and open the airway. The epiglottis is also an important structure in respect to its applied anatomy because we use the epiglottis as a point of reference when you're intubating a patient. And the space between anterior to the epiglottis and posterior to the tongue is called the vollecula. And we'll discuss this a little bit further when we're talking about intubation. What's also considered is the surface anatomy of the airway. An important landmark is the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple, um, which is more prominent in males. But at this point, if you move Further down, you reach the cricothyroid ligament, also known as the cricothyroid membrane. Below that is the cricoid cartilage, which is an, a harder structure felt below that membrane. And important reference point is the cricothyroid membrane because we can perform surgical airways through this potential uh, space. And we also have to consider differences in the airway between adults and kids. So the main differences are the kids have large heads, they have large tongues, and they have floppy U-shaped epiglottises. And this means that um, just minor flexion and extension of the airway of a child can actually kink off the airway and also the tongue can actually is full obstruct the airway a lot easier in a child than an adult. And the narrowest points of the pediatric airway is actually below the vocal cords. So when uh, we might be intubating a child and we are confident that we've gone through the vocal cords, we can actually find that uh, it's difficult to pass the uh, endotracheal, endotracheal tube through this point. Okay, so let's consider some causes of acute airway failure. And as I consider the airway to be a tube, we can apply our usual algorithm of extramural, mural, and intraluminal causes. 
So extramural causes of acute airway failure can be trauma, um, which can include the face, the head, neck, and burns around the airway, severe edema, such as angioedema in allergic or anaphylaxis, um, neck hematomas, which can actually occur after thyroid surgery. And this is why we keep a, a thyroid kit next to a patient who's recently had thyroid surgery, so we can actually split the wound open if they do develop a neck hematoma and compromise the airway. Thyroid cartilage fractures, uh, fat or large necks in obese patients, and abscesses. Mural causes could be also angioedema because it's the uh, acute allergic reaction inside the tissues which actually results in the swelling inside the walls of the airway. Burns to the mouth we can, which can also uh, simulate acute inflammatory reaction in the airways or the walls of the airways. Infection and neoplasms. And intraluminal causes can be foreign bodies, laryngospasms, uh, tongue obstruction as we talked about before and bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsies because the laryngeal uh, nerves actually keep the vocal cords open and if we have both one um, being affected it causes adduction of one of the vocal cords but the airway is still intact however if we have a bilateral obstruction both vocal cords will adduct and close the airway it's pretty rare and also another intraluminal cause can be a peritonsal abscesses or a large ton or large tonsillitis and have seen this in the emergency department um, and patients come in with large tonsillitis or uh, quincy which is also known as peritonsal abscess and there is a very much a potential of that patient obstructing their airway from such large swelling so let's move on now to assessing airway and again we break up the assessment into patency and protection and when we're looking for a patent airway, we apply the look, listen, and feel assessment. So we look. At the neck, we look at the lips, the mouth, the tongue, the inside the pharynx, and the chest. And we're looking for swelling, we're looking for injury, burns to the face, uh, injury to the neck, the lips, the mouth, the tongue, the tonsils or inside the pharynx. We're looking for foreign bodies or uh, foreign material inside the mouth. And we're also looking for central sosis and rashes. And next we listen. And we listen for patient speech or their inability to speak or cough. We look, we look for, sorry, we listen for breath sounds. <laughs> um, and we listen, do that by listening over the mouth. And then we also listen for other additional sounds or obstructions such as stride or gurgling or snoring. And an excellent way of actually hearing these sounds is actually in the anesthetic. Um, when you're applying an anesthetic to a patient um, and as soon as they uh, become unconscious, they collapse their airway and they have additional, still have respiratory efforts and they'll actually uh, sound like they're snoring. And that's because the tongue is now prolapsed back onto the soft tissues and obstructing the airway. So if ever in theatre, just listen out for that as soon as the patient becomes um, unconscious and just before that, um, the anesthetic is to be applied bag mask ventilation. Next in the set, we feel. Uh, so we feel for breathing over the mouth and we also feel for facial fractures, which can obviously uh, cause obstruction via directly or indirectly via hematoma formation. And once we've gathered all our information from look, listening and feeling, we make an assessment and we make an assessment by considering is this a patent airway, is it a potentially potential obstruction, is it a partial obstruction or is it a complete obstruction. And just a side note, uh, stridor is, um, when you hear stridor, it's 70% obstruction or greater than that, but not complete obstruction. And stridor is predominantly an inspiratory sound. So if you hear uh, a loud a sound on expiration, it can't really. So next in our assessment, we look for features of protection. 
and as mentioned previously, uh, protected airway is um, a patient mainly protects their airway via their level of consciousness and maintaining their muscular tone. So we're looking for ultra levels of consciousness such as agitation, confusion, obtundation and loss of consciousness. And we can make the assessment via the AVPU method or you can do a direct GCS assessment but AVPU is quite a good easy assessment to make. We can also look out for compensatory features of partial obstruction as in the patient sitting up and leaning forwards or maintaining the tripod position, reluctant to speak or cough, and increase in work of breathing, which um, can be signs such signs as nasal flaring, accessory muscle use, pursed lips, and paradoxical chest movements. All right, so let's talk about how to manage the airway or the compromised airway. So first step of managing the airway is recognize uh, there is an obstruction and next give supplemental oxygen, uh, preferably through a non rebreather mask. It's next important to call for help, uh, whether this be a MET call or a code blue, um, which will bring down help like uh, the ICU registrar, the anesthetics registrar, um, uh, the medic, senior medical registrar, and also um, nursing staff and anyone else who's on the ward, generally a lot of people do come. So if you feel like uh, you are out of depth at any time, call a code or a MET call. If, there is, if there's any content such as vomit in the airway, you can suction the airway using Yankow Sucker. Um, and then next thing to do is apply three basic airway maneuvers, head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. So if you look at picture number one, this picture is demonstrating the head tilt and chin lift. So you apply extension of the head and you lift the chin up. Um, and this will bring the tongue forward. Um, and picture number two demonstrates the jaw thrust. So this maneuver is actually um, subluxing the mandible forward and lifting the tongue um, off the soft tissue of the airway. And what you do can do is place your palms, or uh, rest the palms on the patient's um, maxilla, and then place your fingers behind the angle of the mandible and sublux the jaw upwards, as demonstrated in the picture. Um, sometimes the patient might have a collar and cuff on, uh, which makes the head tilt and chin lift. Um, impossible to do and uh, when we consider the airway we also consider the c-spine so in those circumstances a jaw thrust uh, will have to be performed okay so once we applied head tilt chin lift jaw thrust we apply a, uh, a bag and mask one of the air viva bags with a mask attached and we ventilate and we can do this via two-handed techniques or one-handed techniques. As all medical practitioners um, should be proficient in performing bag mask ventilation because it's not just sticking the mask on the face and ventilating away. You need to create a good seal to ventilate, adequately ventilate the patient. And by doing this, we need to sublux the jaw by applying jaw thrust. And um, I really highly recommend it uh, actually going into theatre and um, getting your hands on, getting some hands on experience with bag mask ventilation. Because uh, you actually find out how, if you haven't done it before, it actually is quite difficult. And um, models you practice on don't really do justice, um, especially with the large variety of patients you have in the population. Um, should get exposed to a lot of different um, patients and actually get um, reasonably proficient at it. Um, you find that if I, I've got reasonably, you know, reasonable sized hands for a guy, <laughs> um, but I do find the one technique which is the CE grip, so applying um, kind of C shape with your thumb and index finger around the um, base 
uh, around the mask and then using the, my last three fingers to, uh, particularly my little finger to get behind the jaw of the mandible and sublux it forward and hold the mask and the jaw um, in congruency and together to create a, a good seal. Um, but it, create, it you need a lot of hand strength for this and some and people with little hands are, have have difficulty with this even I have difficulty with it um, and I'm, st I'm still learning um, even anesthetic registrars have difficulty with the heart one-handed technique so if you have, if you think you're not ventilating the patient properly you haven't got a good seal you f you're feeling leaks um, switch right to two-handed technique um, and this is where you basically it's a double C ear grip so you you're subluxing your jaw if you your three fingers um, really bring up forward and pushing the mask with both thumb and index fingers into the face. So it's this upward movement of jaw thrust and pressing down also the mask on top to actually create the seal. Definitely get some experience on it. Um, it, it is actually worthwhile. Um, you'll probably enjoy it too. Um, but um, after all these maneuvers, bag mask ventilation can still be uh, really difficult in some patients, um, as I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, so what we can do is actually put in some airway adjuncts, and these are um, adjuncts that we put into the airway to help the airway stay open, and these are the orofaryngeal airway, um, more popularly known as the Goodell airway, and the nasopharyngeal airway. And it's important to size these airway um, airway adjuncts first. So you basic with the or Goodell airways, um, you measure by uh, from the front incisors to the angle of the mandible. And with the nasopharyngeal airway, you size it from the basically the nose to the angle of the mandible too. Uh, large guys usually take a five, size five, which is um, has a red uh, tube on it. Um, and other patients take size four, or even small patients take a size three. There are even also pediatric Goodells, which are really small and can go down to a zero. So these are the things that make um, bag mask ventilation difficult. And if they've had a previous uh, difficulty bag, um, difficult bag mask ventilation, um, this is probably the best predictor because basically it means that someone else has come along, most likely in these for this. And have had trouble bag masking them. So this is really when you want to get a lot of help on board. Um, beards make um, creating the seal very difficult. Short fat necks are, are difficult to, especially it's um, find it very difficult to sublux their jaw in these guys. Um, guys with obstructive sleep apnea can be very difficult also because of their fat jaw, uh, sorry, fat necks. Um, people with dentures, so if you take the dentures out of these patients, um, dentures actually kind of hold the structure of the mouth and so you can actually apply the mask right down on the face. Then if you take the dentures out, you're losing that structure and makes bag masking ventilation very difficult, kind of um, ventilating just a, a bag of skin. And um, structural facial abnormalities also obviously can make bag mask ventilation very difficult because you don't have that same normal congruency with the face and the mask. So other things we can do is apply advanced airways. Um, and these include the laryngeal mask and extracheal intubations. And the laryngeal mask is not a definitive airway. It provides some protection, but it doesn't protect the airway um, completely. The only thing that can protect the airway is endotracheal intubation be because uh, when you apply the cuff, um, there's a cuff around the tube and then you inflate it, it basically closes off the airway so nothing can get in and get out. So if the patient does vomit into the airway, the vomit will sit on top of that um, cuff. So the technique for insertion is there's a black line, make sure the black line faces the nose and you direct it down against the hard palate until you feel a clunk or resistance is felt. And sometimes you actually need to apply some jaw thrust to actually get the tongue out the way so you can push the laryngeal mask in and then you inflate the cuff um, and attach a ventilator device which can be either the Aviva bag or a actual ventilator tube and the usual size uh, for F5 to 4 and females can be either 4 to 3 
And there are different types of laryngeal masks. There are actually quite a lot. Of, it's actually surprising a lot of studies done in laryngeal masks. What um, are better masks? What may be a little bit um, uh, worse masks in a way, I guess. But they're all they do the same job. So in situational ward, if you need to put in a laryngeal mask because you need to be doing a lot of bag mask ventilation, um, just put in a standard uh, laryngeal mask. Uh, there are other uh, LMAs such as the Pro Seal, uh, which um, has a, just a better seal and also has a, a connection whereby you actually pass um, pass uh, things into the esophagus. So basically, the tip or the apex of the LMA sits at, in the esophagus, and it means that if the patient does vomit, to the mask you can actually suction that up. And just from a historical point of view, so when a patient usually before the advent of laryngeal masks and anaesthetists have to um, sit with the patient right beside the patient actually uh, bag mask or hold the mask against the patient's face. So it meant long hours of holding mask with chin lift and jaw thrust, um, sitting there with the patient um, and making sure the uh, airway had a good seal. Um, but now with a laryngeal mask that basically takes it away so you can put the mask in and you can do other things now. You don't have to hold the mask. So the next step, um, which is usually done by more advanced professionals, is endotracheal intubation. And this is a definitive airway. It protects the airway. And the technique for in, uh, inserting an intubation or endotracheal tube is um, first, making sure that you have everything set up for it. It is not a procedure you kind of see on TV that everyone says, just give me the lingoscope and I'll whack in an uh, endotracheal tube. It actually goes, it needs to be a bit of plan before you do a intubation uh, to make sure um, you maximize your chances of getting it right and also limiting um, complications of intubation. So first we have to make sure we have all our equipment and usually we use a, a Macintosh blade which is a curved blade, there are different sizes, um, the straight blade, um, I think Miller's blades and they're usually used in paediatric or um, anaesthetics um, and what we do is we apply head, chin lift, head tilt, um, open the airway and, and insert laryngoscope. It's a left-handed instrument, so with your left hand instrument, you insert it on to the right and sweep the tongue across to the left and then advance the blade into the vallecula, which you mentioned before was the space between the tongue and the epiglottis. And then you lift the laryngoscope up. So you basically lift in the direction of the handle, straight up, never lever leave the, the handle backwards because you'll smash teeth and it means when you smash teeth you have bleeding and you can get a foreign body in the airway you get a lot of bleeding in the airway you and obstruct your vision um, also it's a lot there's uh, large medical legal issues with um, um, smashing people's teeth and that's where our anesthetic uh, anesthetist premiums go up and so once you have leave it in the appropriate direction and you can visualize the vocal cords, you basically aim your endotracheal tube in the goalposts and score a goal. And I should have mentioned previously before, you have to make sure your equipment is working and this happens a bit, I've, I've seen it. Um, make sure the laryngoscope is working. And once it's in, we have to make sure it's in the right place. It's in the lung, as in the uh, trachea and hasn't gone down a bronchi, or hasn't, worse, hasn't gone down the esophagus. So we make sure correct place and by measuring the entitled CO2, which is the gold standard. You see, um, if we see misting of the tube, we can see a good chest rise and fall with bag ventilation and equal breath sounds on auscultation, on auscultation sorry. And we also auscultate over the epigastrum. Um, case we hear air bubbles, which might mean uh, in the esophagus. And as mentioned previously, endotracheal intubation is not a procedure um, done lightly. There are a lot of consequences and complications. Uh, 
The main complication is failure to intubate, which can be disastrous. Esophageal intubation, if not recognised, is disastrous and has killed people. Vocal cord trauma can occur. Endobronchial intubation can occur, which means that you might get a uh, contralateral lung collapse and also damage to the teeth. And just to reiterate um, and really kind of drum in, every unsuccessful attempt makes the next attempt more difficult. So if by some usually do if you're going to do intubation you'd ho hopefully have some supervision with you but if you by all means have to do it um every just remember every attempt makes the next one worse so when the anesthetist comes along the person who's head on show comes along it makes their life so much more difficult and bag mass ventilation can solve that problem So overall, endotracheal intubation shouldn't be done by novices. If you're doing it, good. Make sure you've got some supervision um, and don't try and do it. And to limit those complications and also to kind of estimate how difficult the intubations can be, um, we um, assess the airway and we apply, we, do, we apply the lemon criteria, basically. or It's a good algorithm. I like it because I remember it. <laughs> um, and it's look. And then we estimate the three, three, two rule, which um, is uh, three centimeters or three fingers, the incisor gap. So we get the patient to open up their mouth and we see if we can fit three fingers in there and the thyroid mental distance. So the distance from the, basically the, the um, mandible, from the mandible, we measure three fingers down uh, across horizontally and then two fingers vertically, vertically to the thyroid cartilage or to laryngeal prominence and if that's greater than seven centimeters that means it's going to be a relatively easy uh it's a good way on good intubation um the mal and patty score which um and this is the mal and patty score and um there are four uh four grades um so the first grade you can see the um tonsillar pillars and the uvula. Second grade, you can partially see the uvula. Third grade, you can only see soft palate and fourth grade, you can only see hard palate. And then we assess for any obstruction, so obstruction in the neck or um, uh, lump and bumps that, that could potentially cause obstruct, obstruct the airway. And then N is for neck flexion, so um, you're asking the patient to extend and flex their neck. Um, Difficult patients actually be patients who have fused spinal fusions or who have arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and this, you need to assess this in your preoperative um, assessment because if you have um, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, you have to be careful actually extending their neck because you actually um, it can actually cause um, damage. So this is the thyroid mental distance and we make sure that's greater than seven centimeters. Um, if by all means we've tried to intubate the patient, hasn't worked, we've tried all the above, basically we move on to the surgical airway and this is um, basically crisis. Everyone's around, you've called everybody, uh, we can't get a tube in, can't ventilate the patient, um, deterior the deteriorating, we need to access the airway urgently and we can do it by three two main mechanisms um, the needle cricothyroidomy and the surgical cricothyroidotomy and this is again when mentioning the potential space that uh, cricothyroid membrane with the needle cricothyroidotomy we stick a large ball needle you can find stick it in and um, you can actually buy some certain attachments um, bag must ventilate through that or also jet, vent jet ventilate by high pressure um, basically air compressor the surgical cricothyroidotomy is actually a proper kit where you um, actually in, um, using a scalpel access the cricothyroid membrane and dissect through that and um, using a special uh, instrument that comes in a pack actually pass in a tube into the trachea and if you want to watch that there's a YouTube link there
and um, not as an urgent um, for an urgent airway, but there you can do a tracheostomy to actually provide a patent airway, mainly for patients in ICU um, who are going to um, need long-term ventilation, um, which is and tracheostomies are more comfortable than actually having a patient who um, in ICU who has a an tracheal tube in for a long time. I'm just going to mention breathing very quickly because um, this is an airway lecture, but basically on the wards, if you um, want to increase a patient's oxygenation, there are two things you can do. Increase it, and this is not also not on the ward, but also in ICU. Uh, we increase their FiO2, so basically a fraction of inspired oxygen, and uh, apply PEEP, which is peak end expiratory pressure. And the ways we can increase FiO2 are um, turning up the oxygen on the wall and also using non rebreather masks. So the HUD, standard Hudson mask only provides about 0.4 of FiO2, which means basically 40% is a of what's inspired is 100% oxygen. And this is because there's a lot of, you see, Hudson mask has holes in it, so it allows air, normal air to come in, which is only 21% oxygen. So you're not providing. The goal is to provide as much oxygen as possible, which is 100% or an FiO2 of, of 1. So applying a non rebreather mask um, means that there's a reservoir for 100% oxygen, which increases uh, the availability of 100% oxygen. And this is all dependent on uh, flows of oxygen. Um, when you, you can usually turn up to about 10 to 15 litres on the wall. Um, on the wall of war, of a ward, and um, usually at rest in normal patient, um, in normal person, um, flow rates are about fifteen liters. So that can um, Hudson mask attached to a wall um, and wall oxygen to about ten to fifteen liters can actually supply a good amount of oxygen. However, in patients with respiratory distress or airway distress, those flow rates increase and actually can increase to forty liters a minute. Um, so you can imagine you can only supply 10 to 15 liters again to a wall um, from the wall oxygen of 100% oxygen, but you're you're acquiring 30 liters extra of oxygen, and that has to come from the atmosphere. So you you're providing um, not as much oxygen. So if you can get maybe um, an extra liter or so from that rebreather, you're actually increasing the FiO2. You can get PEEP by actually just sitting up the patient, which will help. Or when you bag mask ventilating, you can actually get peak valves, which means that when you, uh, it will keep some um, pressure um, in the airway system to stent open the airways, and that's the main uh, thing what peak does. There are also other um, physiological aspects of peak which I won't discuss, but um, from a basic standpoint, peak basically stents the airways open. Next thing soon we can consider is actually a ventilation method. So there's positive pressure ventilation um, as opposed to negative pressure ventilation is what we do um, with our diaphragm. Uh, bag mask ventilation, which we've spoken about, um, you can DPAP uh, or BiPAP, or mechanical ventilation is actually via a, um, a ventilator, which can, and we think about. Uh, different modes of ventilation. Uh, I'm not going to really discuss ventilation, but we can use. So as I mentioned before, we increase our work of breathing, we increase our flow rates, and we need um, a high FiO2. So we need to use different delivery systems, such as um, masks or reservoir bags. Um, some mention venturi masks. Venturi masks uh, actually allow you to give a fixed um, FiO2 via the venturi system basically just creates a, a, a vortex in the chamber um, and allows you to mix it so only a certain percentage of oxygen to deliver that to a person. And these can be useful in patients with uh, who are CO2 retainers. So we don't want to give high FiO2s to patients who are uh, CO2 retainers because we can actually blunt their respiratory drive. So look, in summary, um, we need to we have air, acute airway failure and abstraction. We need to recognize the airway and ventilation problem. We need to call for help immediately. We need to give supplemental oxygen. Do the basic things. Do head, head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust.
Those are maneuvers that save lives. Grab a bag and mask and start ventilation. And if you have them available, you can use some airway adjuncts. Um, I've even heard of people using <laughs> a Goodell airway and inserting two pharyngeal, nasopharyngeals in so they've had to actually keep the airway open. And then we go to more specialized things such as endotracheal intubation and the surgical airway. So thanks very much for listening. I know it's been a bit of a long uh, podcast, but hopefully you learned something. I'll see you later.